Good afternoon um, and welcome to today's UW's <coughs> Division of Extension Badger Dairy Insights program. The Badger Dairy Insights uh, series is part of our Farm Ready Research Winter program Programming for Agriculture. Today's session is emer uh, Emerging Reproductive Strategies Using IVF Embryo Transfer. My name is Maria Jose Fonsalida. I am the Dairy Livestock Educator for Dane County, and I'll be your moderator today. We will, uh, we will ask that you please mute your microphones during today's presentation, as it will improve audio quality for all participants. The mute icon should be in the lower left hand of your screen. If you see a line through the microphone graphic, your line is muted. We encourage your questions during today's session. Please use the chat feature in the bottom center of your screen to type in your questions during the program. Today's program features two speakers who will provide valuable information on using IVF embryo transfer. Our first presenter, Dr. Paul Fricky, will present um, about using uh, the use of IVF embryo transfer. And Dr. Fricky's research program focuses on understanding the biology underlining the many reproductive pro uh, problems presented by modern dairy cattle. Dr. Paul Fricky was raised on his family's row crop and dairy farm located near Papillion, Nebraska, where his family continues to farm today. After receiving a bachelor's degree in animal science in 1988 from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, Paul went on to complete um, a master's degree in 1992 and a PhD in 1996 in reproductive physiology from the Department of Animal Science at North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. In 1996, Paul accepted a position as a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Dairy Science in the Department of Animal Health and Biomedical Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Paul joined the faculty in the Department of Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on July 1st in 1998, and he was promoted to Associate Professor in ten, with tenure in 2004 and to full, professor, uh, to full professor in 2009. And before we get started, I would like to uh, take a moment to recognize the rest of our extension team contributing to today's program. Let me see what's going on with the chat, sorry. And also, sorry that I forgot to mention something else. Uh, remember that if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box and we will make sure that we will um, ask those questions to Paul and Jim. So we would like to also recognize the rest of our extension um, team contributing to today's program. Amanda Young, Dairy and Livestock Educator for Dodge County. Ashley Olson, Agriculture Extension Educator for Vernon County. Jackie McCarvel, Agriculture Extension Educator for Green County. Ryan Sterry, Agriculture Extension Educator for San Crox County. Heather Slexer, Dairy Educator for Marathon County. And with that, on behalf of our team, I would like to thank you again um, for joining us. And here we're ready for Dr. Paul Fricke's presentation. Paul? All right. Maria Jose, thank you very much for that introduction. Maria Jose was one of my former graduate students. When did you <laughs> actually, when did you actually get your degree? Wasn't it 2014? I don't remember. You're supposed to remember that. I don't remember that. But it was a while ago. 2014. It was, it was a while ago. Yeah. Anyhow, so yeah, thank it was you. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that introduction, Maria Jose. And I've asked that if anybody has questions as we go through, you know, you can put your questions in that chat box. 
And Maria Jose, you can just stop me. If you get a really good question, I think it's nice to maybe address that question while we're kind of going through the information that's that's on the screen. So don't don't be afraid to um, to stop me. Okay. So anyhow, it's it's just a great pleasure to to be here with with everyone today and um, for this Badger Dairy Insight webinar here on January 26th. Again, I'm Paul Fricke. I'm a professor of dairy science in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences. I'm also affiliated with with UW Extension. And let me see if I can, there we go. So just wanted to share with you my outline. Um, today I want to go, go through three different studies. So I've broadened my topic a little bit beyond just the IVF embryo stuff because that, that's really pretty quick to talk about. I want to talk about some of the applications for uh, human chorionic gonadotropin and why we're interested in this particular molecule and why, uh, how that uh, works with, with reproductive physiology. And so here's the three studies I'm gonna talk about. The first one is um, looking at a dose response for HCG for induction of ovulation seven days after a synchronized ovulation in lactating Holstein cows. And so this is gonna be a question that's gonna be germane for what I'm gonna talk about in the last study, which is the IVF embryo transfer study. Um, the second study is really a follow-up on this first study. And we asked the question whether we could replace the first GNRH treatments in the breeding off-sync portion of a double off-sync protocol with HCG. And again, I'll, I'll kind of explain the ideas behind that and um, why we thought that that might work and, and show you guys the results of that. And then I'm going to finish up with really what the title of my talk is, this effective treatment with HCG seven days after artificial insemination or at the time of embryo transfer on reproductive outcomes in uh, these milliparous Holstein heifers. So we'll get to study three, but I just want to cover a little bit of information that I think you guys will find interesting uh, in, these, in these first two studies. So those of you who know me, uh, I, I like to dive into reproductive physiology a little bit. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a review on, on Repro 101. This is a cartoon of the hypothalamic gonadal axis, pituitary gonadal axis. And this is, from an endocrine, endocrine standpoint, this is what we're manipulating when we do, like, say, synchronization programs. So this is the hypothalamus up here at the top. And from the hypothalamus, we get gonadotropin releasing hormone, which we call GNRH. Now, obviously, GNRH, we can, we can buy GNRH, and we can administer GNRH to cows, and that's what we do during an off-sync protocol. And so GNRH from the hypothalamus acts at the level of the anterior pituitary to secrete these two gonadotropins that we call luteinizing hormone, or LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. So these are the two gonadotropins that regulate the reproduction cycle. We give GNRH to cows to induce an LH surge. And that LH surge in turn acts on the ovary to induce a follicle to ovulate. Now there's all kinds of these negative inhibitory feedback loops and we'll talk just a little bit about that. The one I'm, I'm not showing on here is the one with, with progesterone has a negative inhibition um, on LH secretion, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So I wanna show you a little bit more about these two gonadotropins. They really run the show with regard to the reproductive cycle in cattle. So this, these are just kind of cartoons of, of the structures. So the first two structures are the two pituitary gonadotropins that I talked about, FSH and LH. The third one is human chorionic gonadotropin. And so these are native, the first two are native to cattle. And all three of these structures have a common alpha subunit. So this is just a polypeptide chain. It's covalently linked to a beta subunit. And you can see that it's the beta subunit that confers specificity. So the beta subunit of FSH is different than the beta subunit of LH. Alpha subunit is common. And notice what this cartoon is showing us here is that HCG is very similar to bovine LH. And in fact, the amino acid sequence homology is about 80%. These little structures that you can see sticking off here, that's meant to, to show uh, there's a lot of carbohydrate associated with this particular molecule. And that confers some really interesting properties to this molecule, HCG, that we don't see 
um, with LH. So that's just a little bit about some of you know, the biochemistry of, of what we're talking about. Remember, we're gonna be talking about HCG. Just remember that HCG is like giving a cow uh, LH. Now we can purchase HCG, it's available on the market. What is HCG? It's human, a human glycoprotein hormone produced by these certain specific cells in the placenta. It's involved with maternal recognition of pregnancy and CL maintenance in humans. On the market, this is called Coriolan. And any of you who have ever used Coriolan, it comes uh, lyophilized, so it's dry. And then you have a diluent. There's 10 uh, mils of diluent. There's 10,000 international units of HCG. So it's about 1,000 international units per mil that you get in a bottle of uh, human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, one of the things that I talked about with human chorionic gonadotropin, remember it has a lot more carbohydrate associated with it, and that has a protective quality for that particular hormone. So this is some work from my former, uh, former grad student, Julio Giordano. He did his master's thesis. This is actually from the University of Tennessee. And he compared directly the profile of LH with human chorionic gonadotropin. So this is the GnRH-induced LH surge that would normally induce ovulation in a cow. And notice from the time you give uh, GnRH, you get a very quick rise in LH, and then it drops off relatively quickly. So within about five or six, seven hours, the LH surge is over. And it's this LH surge that normally causes ovulation. When you give HCG, HCG is a different molecule and it has all this carbohydrate associated with it. So it sticks around in circulation a lot longer. So what you'll see is HCG comes up and it, it actually peaks quite a bit later, but it'll hang out for a long time in circulation. Um, this could be seen as a positive thing, but in many ways it could be seen as a negative thing. And I'll talk a little bit about what we think might be some of the negative consequences of the fact that HCG sticks around for a, a little bit too long. So that's just the profile of uh, LH and HCG in circulation when you treat cows with either GnRH or uh, HCG. Now, why are we, I just wanna try to explain a little bit of the physiology and why we're interested in using HCG. I mean, we can give GnRH to a cow that causes an LH surge, which causes ovulation. So what's the problem? This is just a graph um, of an experiment that we did where we were taking blood samples three times a week. Day zero is ovulation. And so this is showing what happens when you ovulate a follicle, you form a corpus luteum, and that corpus luteum will grow up and secrete progesterone. And so progesterone starts fairly low, and you're gonna see progesterone come up. And in animals that get pregnant, that corpus luteum is maintained and corpus luteum just stays there for the entire pregnancy. But I wanna show you something here on day seven. If you were to treat an animal with GnRH on day seven, there's about three nanograms per mil of progesterone that's present. And that progesterone has a negative effect on the GnRH induced LH surge. Okay, so that's a negative thing. So those of you who've heard me talk about OVSYNC, we know that Day seven is the day that we want to start an OVSYNC protocol. So there's good things about day seven, and that is that there's a dominant follicle ready to be ovulated. But there's a bad thing about day seven, and that is there's a little bit of progesterone there, and that's going to inhibit the action of GnRH to induce an LH surge. So we did a quick little experiment here, and here's an OVSYNC protocol. We started this OVSYNC protocol. So G1 was on day seven of the estrus cycle. And um, G2 is, is after the prostaglandin treatment. And we treated either, and we called this G1 high progesterone, we called G2 low progesterone. And just look and see what happens here. When progesterone is present, this is the LH surge here. So when you treat with 100 micrograms of GnRH, that's the labeled dose of, of GnRH, you can see that you get a nice LH surge in this low progesterone environment. But when there's progesterone present, it attenuates that LH surge. So they don't ovulate as much as we would like them to. That's the problem with day seven. 
we doubled the dose of GnRH to see what happened. And you can see in both cases, we get more um, LH, okay? And we get a little bit better of an LH surge in a high progesterone environment, but uh, it's still uh, quite a bit attenuated. Now, what can happen then is if we replace GnR, GnRH with HCG, this inhibition doesn't happen. So in other words, we can use G, we can use HCG to ovulate follicles that wouldn't otherwise ovulate if we were getting, uh, giving GnRH. So that's just a little bit of the background um, on HCG and why we think it might be useful. So I want to get to the first study then. And the first study was titled Human Chorionic Gonadotropin Dose Response for Induction of Ovulation Seven Days After Synchronized Ovulation in Lactating Holstein Cows. So we set up cows, and I'll show you this on the next slide, to ovulate, and they're gonna grow up this first wave dominant follicle. And we're gonna challenge with different doses of HCG on day seven. And specifically day seven, because that's the best day to start an off-sync protocol, and that's what we're interested in. Nobody really knows what the optimal dose of HCG is. There's 10,000 IU in a bottle, but you don't need all 10,000 international units to ovulate a follicle. So here's the question. What is the optimal dose of HCG required to ovulate a first wave dominant follicle in lactating Holstein dairy cows? That's the question that we're asking. This is our experimental design. This is the last GnRH treatment of a double off-sync protocol. So we did this on a commercial dairy farm here in Southern Wisconsin. They were all submitted to a double off-sync protocol for first breeding. That's the last generation of that protocol. And then they received a timed artificial insemination. Seven days after that last generation, we randomized cows to these different treatments. We had an un untreated control group. We had what we would call a positive control group where we were giving 100 micrograms of GnRH. And then we had 1,000, 2,000, 2,500, or 3,300 IU of HCG. So that's our dose response. A tenth of a bottle, 2 mLs, 2.5 mLs, or 3.3. This would be a third of a bottle, or a quarter of a bottle, or a fifth of a bottle. And so then what uh, the students were out doing is they would ultrasound at this particular time. They would measure what's on the ovaries. And they would determine then whether or not those cows actually ovulated to these different treatments. So that's how we're going to determine what the optimal uh, dose is. And so the results are, are straightforward. And uh, this is, I think, a unique contribution to the scientific literature because nobody had really ever done this in this way before. In the control animals that were treated with nothing, there was just a few cows that ovulated, and that was just kind of a random thing. Essentially, this is zero here. When you give GNRH on day seven, the ovulatory response was 79%. The reason it's not 100%, and we knew that there was a follicle there, okay, the students saw it with, a, with an ultrasound machine, but you don't ovulate all the follicles because that progesterone's there inhibiting the GnRH-induced LA surge. That's pretty typical with what we get uh, with GnRH, about 80% of the cows will ovulate. 1,000 IU of HCG, no difference. So 1,000 I use about equivalent to GnRH. When we got into these higher doses, you can see that we could force that ovulatory response to 89, 93, and 96%. You know, we're probably never going to get to 100%. That's just not the way biology works. When we looked at the data, and I'll show you this on, on the next slide as well, we felt that 2,500 IU of ACG was optimal in this particular study. And one of the reasons is because it was statistically better than this generation. In fact, it was plus 14 percentage points better uh, than GnRH in this particular scenario. So 93%. We didn't feel that 96% auditory response, it's not different here. And again, you're starting to get a little bit more costly when you're out in this particular range. So we felt that 2,500 international units of HCG was, was kind of our our optimal dose in this particular study. The other thing we looked at is just the CL volume. How big did the CL get and what did it do to progesterone? So again, these are the untreated controls. So they have, you know, about that three nanograms per mil of progesterone on, on day seven. 
and this is the actually the increase from day seven to 14. But you can see as we ovulate more follicles, we get more progesterone. Again, this 2,500 IU dose optimizes ovulatory response, we think, and also optimizes um, the, the progesterone that we can get uh, out of there. So we had to do this particular study first um, to do this second study. And the question that we're asking here is, can we replace the first GnRH treatment of a double obstinate protocol with ACG? Okay, so this is an obstinate protocol, GnRH, prostaglandin, GnRH, and timed AI. And so the question is, what would happen if we replaced this uh, GnRH with a treatment of HCG? Now, I want to show you a study that had, had done this. Notice this is an older obsync protocol, the second prostaglandin that we typically would include here, 24 hours after the first, was not included in this study. And that's an important concept. So they compared this GnRH up front with HCG up front. And notice that the auditory response was a little bit better with HCG. The point I want to make here is in this study and in several other studies, it appeared that replacing GnRH with HCG actually had a negative effect on fertility. And that's an interesting concept. We felt that that might be due to the fact that they didn't have that second prostaglandin treatment in the protocol at that particular time. So it was inhibiting maybe luteal regression. And so we followed up our first study, that dose response study with this second study. So this, the title of this study was replacing the first GnRH treatment in the breeding obstinate portion of a double obstinate protocol uh, with HCG. These are studies that were done by my uh, current grad student, um, Lisa Carrera. So here's, here's what we did. This is a, this is a double obstinate protocol for first breeding. And obviously you're gonna give, here's the first obstinate here. And then here is the breeding obstinate portion of the protocol. We're gonna use either GnRH or we're gonna use HCG. Now again, why would we wanna swap out GnRH for HCG? Well, we're gonna get about 80% auditory response with GnRH. We're gonna get about 14 percentage points more ovulations with HCG, and the more cows that ovulate to the first part of the protocol theoretically will have the highest fertility. Notice that we have that second prostaglandin in both of these protocols, okay? So we felt that that would be the difference, that, that with this second prostaglandin that HCG was actually going to give us um, better fertility. So we did this particular study on a farm in northeastern Wisconsin, and one of the things that is complicating our lives with uh, reproduction right now, actually I'm doing quite a bit of talks on this now, um, a lot of farms are no longer using conventional Holstein semen, and this was one of those uh, farms. And so they're using a combination between beef semen and sex semen. So we enrolled cows, first lactation cows were almost exclusively inseminated with sex semen. Very few animals were, uh, first lactation animals were inseminated with beef semen. So we just didn't use these particular cows. There weren't enough here to, to look at. The older cows were split about half and half with beef semen and with sex semen. This is actually done on two different farms. And so for sex semen, we've got an effect of parity. We've got lactation one and we've got the older cows. With beef semen, we only have um, the older cows. So that's the way we did the study. And again, our hypothesis would have been that swapping out GnRH for HCG, when you have this second prostaglandin in the protocol, we felt that this might be better. Now, I've done a lot of experiments in throughout my, my career, and oftentimes I'm wrong. And this is a good example of that. Um, this is the effect of treatment and parity. So we've got first lactation, the heifers, and we've got the older cows. So this is a pregnancy outcome on day 39 after time AI with cows inseminated with sex semen. And what you can see is when you swap GnRH for HCG, there was a negative effect, 4.4 percentage units lower in the first lactation cows for HCG compared to GnRH. And in the older cows, it was even worse. It was almost 10 percentage points. It was 9.1 percentage points lower uh, with HCG. So our hypothesis didn't stand up. 
Um, and obviously, we would not recommend swapping out uh, GnRH for HCG. These are the um, these are the older cows that were inseminated with beef semen. And again, in blue, we've got the GnRH treated, and we've got the HCG treated in red. Same thing happened with beef semen, about seven percentage units lower fertility in these, uh, these cows that, that got the HCG. So again, I've been wrong before, and uh, this is another good example where our hypothesis didn't hold up. Why did we think this happened? Well, we thought it was a problem with luteal regression and that that second prostaglandin would resolve that particular problem. But I guess what we're thinking now is, remember I showed you this graph of how long this HCG stays in circulation. And we think that that may have this negative effect on fertility. It may just be around too long. It may be negatively affecting the oocyte of the follicle that we've synchronized um, to ovulate. So again, we learned, I told my grad student who did this, we learned how not to use uh, HCG uh, in lactating dairy cows through this particular study. Okay, so let's finish up then with, um, with this last study. And this is really what I was thinking of when I was, when I was putting together this particular talk. So I showed you the dose response with HCG, um, showed you an experiment that we did in lactating dairy cows trying to see how we might use HCG to improve fertility. That didn't work out. What we did in this particular study, and the title of the study is The Effect of Treatment with Human Chorionic Gonadotropin Seven Days After Artificial Insemination. So that was the first experiment or at the time of embryo transfer on reproductive outcomes in these milliparous Holstein heifers. This is one of my grad students, Angela Niles, who did this um, a couple of years ago. And heifers, you know, you've got to love working with heifers. So I especially like this one and uh, they're happy, right? Maria Jose, heifers are usually happy when you're working with them. Um, and again, this was, was using Corlon. Now, um, let's show you what, why we're interested in this. This is um, a graph that Angela put together just looking at embryo transfer and the increase oh. in embryo transfer. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, there's one question. Yes. Uh, yes, good. I think it might be, it's related to the previous one though. Yeah. Did 41% yeah, yeah. CR on beef semen on multiple scout treated with DO so surprise you? Um, was there a dairy effect on the results? Yeah, no, people want, yeah, no, it's a good question. And the question is with beef semen, does that fertility surprise me? One thing you always have, so one of the questions that's out there is, is the fertility of beef semen on Holsteins different from Holstein semen on Holsteins, okay? One thing we know about sex semen, there's always a, a slight decrease in fertility with sex semen compared to uh, conventional semen if you randomize the cows to treatments, okay? This is a difficult question to ask on a farm though because they have certain cattle that they're going to just breed with beef semen. So to randomize them to beef and, and Holstein semen is a really difficult thing to do. I don't think that there's big differences between the two semen types. Beef semen might be a little bit lower and our second speaker, Jim Saporsky, is actually on this call. One thing about beef semen is that I don't think the bulls have been selected for uh, semen parameters like our Holstein have over the over the years. And so, you know, I think we're getting better now. I mean, this has all just changed in about five years. I think we're getting a lot better at the beef semen, but there's reasons to believe that beef semen might not be as high of fertility. I don't think they're that different. And that fertility, that 41% conception rate, remember these are in the older cows. And these are not in just any older cows. They're in the older cows that the farm chose to use beef semen on, which tells me that that's just a different group of cows on this particular farm. For whatever reason, they didn't want, they didn't want replace, replacements out of that group of cows. So I don't know, it's a good question. Does that surprise me? That number probably doesn't surprise me too much. That we drove it down that far, that, that probably does surprise me a little bit with ACG. But that's not an unusual conception rate to get in these older cows coming off of a double obstinct, particularly when uh, these are animals that are chosen to, to be used for beef semen. So do you think I answered the question, Maria Jose? That was a good question. Yes, I think I, you did. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. 
Okay, so um, again, we're doing this, this, uh, these two, these two studies with heifers. Okay, so here, here's where I was. If you look at the increase in IVF embryo transfer in the world, and there's two, you got North America and South America. The red line is South America, and what you can see is the South Americans, uh, particularly Brazil has dramatically increased their use of IVF embryo transfer. And there's reasons for that. Um, a lot of the Brazilian dairy animals are crossbred. They're jeer crossbred with Holstein, they call them the jeer Orlando. And they can use IVF uh, embryo transfer to transfer like crossbred embryos in, to keep those lines, the bloodlines correct. Now it's interesting, you see on this graph, you see this kind of dip around 2014. And I asked some of my, my Brazilian uh, grad students and the friends, friends that I had in the department, what the heck happened in 2014? And they said, if you remember, Brazil was playing the World Cup against Germany that year and lost like eight to nothing. And they said the entire country was so depressed that they couldn't transfer any embryos. Actually, you know, that was just kind of a joke, but I don't know, Maria Jose, did you, did you see that game when they, they lost so badly? I think any South Americans watch that game. Yeah, it was very sad. <laughs> at any rate, yeah, so we have we had that dip here. But if you look at North America, North America is kind of lagged behind on these uh, in vitro embryo transfers, but really on a year over year basis. And I think our second speaker, Jim Saporsky, can talk a little bit more about this. This only goes to 2016. On a year over year basis, I think we're just seeing really big increases in IVF embryo transfer in our industry here in the United States. So this is an upcoming technology and it's an exciting technology as well. Um, one of the things that um, Jim Saporsky is gonna talk about are these IVF beef embryos. So he's gonna be talking a little bit about the in vitro herd flex. This is exciting because I think what we're going to see in our industry is a penetration of these uh, sin vitro embryos being transferred into, uh, into, into dairy cows. At least that's the idea. Rather than using beef semen on Holsteins and getting a crossbred calf, you can put a purebred beef embryo into a Holstein and get a purebred, uh, purebred calf. So Jim's gonna talk a little bit more to us about this uh, as the second speaker. Now, IVF embryos are not normal. And so uh, pregnancy loss is, is a problem for IVF embryo transfer. So this is, these are five different studies that Angela pulled together. And these are different studies in which they measured pregnancy loss after IVF embryo transfer. Average pregnancy loss after AI was somewhere here in these particular studies. This is a little higher than I would expect it to be, but that's what it was. But the point is, four of the five studies looking at IVF embryos had even higher rates of pregnancy loss. Oftentimes, we can see double the rates of, of pregnancy loss with um, IVF embryos. So why does that happen? We're not sure. Um, but IVF embryos are not, uh, not normal embryos. And so uh, this is kind of classically one of the problems. So that's just something to keep in mind as, as we go through this particular study. So this is Angela, and Angela did a lot of work on this study, and she was pulling a lot of blood samples. So this is just the experimental design. Two different studies. We either inseminated these heifers artificially, artificial insemination with semen on day zero, or we put them on a synchronization program, and that last generation is the last generation of the protocol, and then they received an embryo on day seven. So this is just showing both of these experiments. Day zero is either artificial insemination or the last generation of the protocol. They either got HCG on day seven or they served as controls. And Angela was pulling blood twice a week on these heifers up to the preg check, which is on day 32. And then basically weekly kept uh, looking at these heifers. Now I'm just gonna show you some of the basic parts of this experiment. We did a lot of different things in this experiment looking at some other compounds, pregnancy-specific protein B, and some of these interferon-stimulated genes. But I'm just going to kind of show you um, the, the basics of what we found. We had 82 uh, heifers per treatment in experiment one, 104 heifers per treatment in experiment two. So here's experiment one. We had 120, actually here's the numbers, 129 control, 132 HDG-treated animals. 
I guess, hang on. This is, this is the number of blood samples that we had within each of these treatments. Sorry about that. 82 animals were blood sampled in experiment one, 104 were uh, blood sampled in experiment two, so a subset. So we had 129 control heifers and 132 HCG treated heifers. So these animals were detected for estrus. This was a tail chalking protocol, once daily tail chalking, and they inseminated them. The control heifers were treated with nothing. And in this experiment, uh, we used 2000 IU of HCG. This was before we had done that dose response. If I had to do this experiment over again, I would use 2500 IU of HCG. And that's the reason we did that dose response because there's all kinds of different doses that are used in different studies in the literature and nobody knew what was optimal. That's, so we used 2000, but nowadays I would use 2500. They were using conventional and sex semen in, uh, it, to breed these heifers. And so first and second services were sex semen as is usual on many dairies and third through fifth are conventional semen. Just remember that we're not randomized controlled when it comes to semen type in this experiment. <clears throat> so these are the results of progesterone from all the samples that Angela had collected. Here's day seven. And notice the animals that were treated with HCG, we saw a dramatic increase in progesterone. Why does this happen? Because on day seven, we ovulated a follicle, we formed an accessory corpus luteum, and we get more progesterone. That's why we're given HCG on day seven, is to do exactly what you're seeing here. We dramatically increase progesterone. And this is relatively high progesterone for those of you that are used to looking at progesterone levels. Eight nanograms per mil, all the way up to 14. So we really got progesterone high uh, in these particular uh, animals. So that's what we wanted to have happen. When we looked in this experiment one, this is the effect of treatment on pregnancy outcomes and pregnancy loss. The pregnancies per AI did not differ due to treatment on day 32 or on day 67, and there was no difference in pregnancy loss. Um, these numbers are low for heifers, and I'll show you that on the next graph, but it's because there was a combination of sex and conventional semen that was being used to breed these particular heifers. Normally, we would like to see heifers with conventional semen somewhere in the uh, close to 60% range. So I'll just go back here. There was no benefit on pregnancy outcomes or pregnancy loss if heifers were inseminated to an estrus. There was no benefit of getting progesterone higher. So we concluded really that, um, you know, progesterone is not the rate limiting step for fertility in heifers bred to an artificial insemination. This is the effect of semen type, and this is interesting. Um, and this kind of will springboard me into the next one of these badger dairy insights that I'm gonna be doing at the beginning of March. And it has, I'm gonna be talking about some of the work we've done uh, with sex semen. Um, one of the things we noticed is we could compare conventional to sex sorted semen and there was a tremendous decrease in fertility of these, these heifers that were bred with sex sorted semen to, compared to conventional. That's more of a drop. So these heifers bred with conventional semen are very close to what we would consider to be average fertility for heifers bred with conventional semen. Normally we like to see about 80 to 85% of the fertility of conventional with sex semen. In this case, it was only 54%. And I'll just give you a little bit of an insight into what I'm going to talk about in, in my next Badger Dairy Insight. Um, I think people are using sex semen uh, like they use conventional semen. And these heifers were bred once daily based on rub tail chalk. And I think that you can't tolerate that much variation in timing of insemination versus when the animals are actually in an estrus with um, sex or in semen. It works fine with conventional semen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about, about that more in my next uh, Badger Dairy Insight. So now on to the last thing I want to talk about. This is experiment two. And these heifers were chosen to receive uh, IVF embryos. The way we set them up as recipients 
was using a five-day cedar sink program. This would be a standard five-day cedar sink program as recommended by the Dairy, um, Dairy Cattle Reproduction Council. So GNRH on day zero, put a cedar in for five days, pull the cedar, give prostaglandin. Day later, they get a second prostaglandin. Two days later, you give GNRH. Now, you can set heifers up this way and breed them to a timed insemination here. But these heifers were set up, this is day zero, so that they would receive an embryo on day seven. We had 148 heifers that received 2000 IU of HCG at the time of embryo transfer. We had 143 heifers that served as untreated controls. And one thing we knew about the embryos that were going into these recipients was the grade. So we knew if they were grade one, grade two, or grade three embryos. And again, if you look at progesterone in this study, this is what we wanted to see. On day seven, at the time of treatment, there's no difference. But when you give HCG on day seven, you're gonna ovulate a follicle, you're gonna form an accessory CL, and you're gonna get more progesterone in these, uh, in these animals that are HCG treated. Notice that overall the progesterone levels are lower than in that first experiment. And we think this was the case because they were synchronized. Uh, we think that synchronization protocol results in ovulation of a bit of a smaller follicle, which then produces a smaller CL, uh, which produces less progesterone. So overall the progesterone levels were less, but the, the, the treatment effect was the same. We were able to increase progesterone uh, by treating with HCG. This is probably the thing that one of the big take home points that I want everybody to think about. When we treated with HCG, there was no impact on pregnancies per ET on day 32 or day 67. And I think that's pretty typical. We see similar pregnancies per ET as we'll see pregnancies per AI to uh, artificial insemination. But the big thing that we saw that we weren't completely expecting in this study, and it's not a, a big study, but in the heifers that served as controls, we saw 22% pregnancy loss, which again is something that is in the literature that that pregnancy loss rate in these IVF embryos might be a little bit higher. But what we found is that when we treated with ACG, we were able to decrease that pregnancy loss by over 50%. Now, I was going to stick another slide in here. Milo Wolfbank has done some a similar study to this in a much larger group of heifers. He was using GNRH rather than HCG to form accessory CL. But in those studies, they found the same uh, effect of getting progesterone increase after embryo transfer. It was, the pregnancy loss rate was in the 20% range, low 20% range for the controls and they decreased pregnancy loss um, by about 50%. And so we're excited about this. It seems that getting progesterone up uh, by treating at the time of IVF embryo transfer with HCG, it seems that we can get this pregnancy loss down. And that's really important, I think, when we start to look at these, um, at these IVF uh, embryos. The last thing I'll show you here is this embryo grade. And uh, so we have the grade ones in blue, the grade twos in green, and the grade threes in red. And so this is the pregnancy per ET on day 32, day 67, and this is a loss from 32 to 67. But you can see there's a tremendous impact of grade of embryo. Grade one embryos were much better than grade two embryos, and the grade three embryos weren't very good at all. There's not many heifers or embryos here. There's only three embryos here. Uh, but the two thirds of them, two out of three uh, lost that pregnancy. And so if you go to certain countries like Brazil, um, I think that they're down to transferring mostly grade one embryos and uh, they don't even transfer these, these grade three embryos. So here's my take home messages. Human chorionic gonadotropin has LH-like activity in dairy cows and heifers and can be used to induce ovulation. So the conclusion from study one, we found that 2,500 IU of HCG is the optimal dose for induction of ovulation and subsequent progesterone production. We like that dose. We think that that's the dose. That's the dose that I would recommend using 
in any applications that we would be using um, ACG for. Uh, study two, do not replace first generation treatment of the breeding obstinate protocol of a double obstinate protocol with ACG. So that did not work. We don't want to do that. And study three, treatment with ACG at the time of embryo transfer decreased pregnancy loss in these uh, nulliparous Holstein hep heifer IVF embryo transfer recipients. So with that, I've gone through my slides and Maria Jose, if there's any other questions, we can entertain those now. And if there's no questions, we can probably move right into the interview with uh, Jim Saporsky. Um, we don't have any more questions. I mean, we can give it just probably a sec to see if anybody wants to uh, ask the question. Um, now's the time. Um, I'd stop sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Any questions from anybody on here? I saw, I think, I think my former student, Glaucio Lopez, is even on this. He, he asked a question about the, uh, the beef semen. In yeah, that beef semen question is a really excellent question. And it's one, there, there's actually a big study that came out from the AIPL lab. It's the, it's the, um, and they did, you know, they're looking at records. The problem is those studies are not randomized controlled studies. Mm -hmm. so they're just looking at fertility of beef semen versus sex semen versus conventional semen in huge numbers of animals in the United States. Obviously, beef semen was lower in that situation. And they even say in that paper, it's likely lower. One of the reasons it's lower is because of the kind of cow that you're using that type of semen on. So oh. the, que the question as to what whether there's a difference in fertility between beef and uh, beef, beef on dairy and dairy on dairy is, is, is an interesting one. It's a hard one to answer. So Dr. Fricky, this is Jim Saporsky. I'll just make a refer to that in your presentation. Yep. You know, over the past four years as beef on dairy has uh, sort of exploded into the industry. Um, prior to that, we probably as, as AI did not have a lot of data on fertility with beef bulls. And one of the reasons is if you understand and you know, a lot of the breeding would go on in the Central Plains in the West, uh, especially on heifers, they would get synchronized, bred once to AI and then turned out with bulls. So you had no real good way of collecting that data. Yep. Yep. Uh, since then, as, as this thing has expanded and exploded, um, we do send out semen to uh, trial herds to dairies uh, uh, and try to collect fertility data early on before we release bulls yeah. into those programs. And I, oh. So yeah. I would agree with you. So there's probably really not a whole lot of difference. Yeah. It's just getting better data on fertility. I think it's getting better data. And I think, I think what happened early on when, when there was the rush to use beef on dairy, nothing was geared up to provide that those straws of beef semen across the industry very well. So people were going everywhere they could possibly get to get a straw semen. Now everything's ramped up and you guys have all the, you know, bulls and testing and all that stuff in place. So I think things have, things have and been And then the second so. comment uh, that we got some information from some vitro here recently, and it's just, it's nothing more than observations and maybe you've already done it, but, uh, I wasn't familiar with it, but they were recommending they saw less uh, early abortions on IVF embryos using metal sheaths, metal mm -hmm. tip sheaths versus plastic tip sheaths. That's only an observation and I'll kind of- uh, That's interesting. Uh, leave it at that, there's probably more to come. Yep. They were do doing that in Idaho, so. Yep. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question with the with the pregnancy loss and these IVF embryos. And I think as um, you know, there's probably media effects, there's probably all kinds of effects. And so getting all that stuff worked out with the technology will it'll it'll get worked out as we move forward. So great comments, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Maria Jose? I think there's one. Well, there's check. one here, yeah. Um, so it says the following. Based on your knowledge, experience, and physiology knowledge, 
Can we say that pulsing cows inseminated with beef semen will have a less persistent lactation curve? No, I don't think you can draw that conclusion. And again, the reason not, I mean, to, to, to fairly ask the question, th there's, a, there's a number of problems. First of all, there's tremendous differences in fertility among bulls. And so how many different bulls are you going to look at? I mean, you, you know, so you, you know, to do experiments to look at male fertility, you've got, you have to look at a lot of bulls. You have to randomize cows to get these two types of semen. And so again, I'm going to argue that if someone sees an observation like that in a herd, you explain that observation more from the fact that the animals that they're choosing to use beef semen on are different than the animals that they're using either sex semen or conventional Holstein semen on. And so you have, you, in, in herds, you don't control for that. Um, but in an experiment, you have to control for that in order to answer that, that particular question. But no, I wouldn't say that that's a foregone conclusion that you're gonna get a less persistent lactation curve uh, with, with beef uh, semen. Thank you. Any other question for Dr. Pricky? You bet. I got to thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Excellent question. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so I guess. Are, oops, yeah. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Ashley. If there are more questions as we go throughout this for for Dr. Fricky, feel free to put them in the chat um, as we go along with our with our next segment for today. Our our interview with Jim. Saporsky from Central Star. Um, I've got um, a slide with some, just a little background with Jim and you can see him, he's, he's got his camera on and, and ready to answer some questions for us today. So just a little background, Jim is Director of AI Sales and Products with Central Star. Um, he's worked in the AI industry since 1978 and most of his career has been with North Star Cooperative, which many uh, farmers and producers out there know, it's now Central Star. Uh, but from 1989 to 1993, he was a classifier with the Holstein Association. And so before we get started, just asking Jim a few questions today that we have, feel free anyone out here to put your questions in the chat box and we'll answer them. We do have a poll question um, for you to answer if Amanda would like to launch that. And so the question, do you currently use or utilize beef semen or beef embryos in your dairy herd? And this will just kind of uh, be able to give Jim and and the rest of us on here, and, and even Dr. Fricky, just some background to see who's on and what you're doing in your herds. Yeah, and just as they're, as they're filling out this poll, uh, again, at the beginning of March, uh, the dairy insight that we're doing then, I'll be talking a lot more about use, the changes in use of beef and, and uh, sex semen in the industry is pretty is fascinating data to see what's going on out there and how quickly things have changed, particularly in the last five years. All right, we've <coughs> some answers here and, and as you can see um, where we're at. Some are all, a lot are sometimes, a lot cows are being, are being bred and, and then we have some never. So thank you for answering those results. All right, Jim. So our first question today really for you is to just tell us about using the, the herd flex sim plot and how it came to be. Um, thank you. It, the, uh... Over probably, it's in the past year, maybe 16, 17 months, uh, one of our sister organizations, Minnesota Select Sires, uh, uh, got interested in, 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 uh, in discussions with Sim Vitro or Simplot out in Idaho. If you're not familiar with them, they are, they are a rather, rather large organization uh, from potatoes to fertilizer to cattle. They are the Second highest, I believe, 
cow-calf operation in the United States with about 30,000 mama cows. So <clears throat> they're quite huge into that and they have their own harvest facilities, et cetera. Um, they developed a, in their animal science department at the harvest facility in, in Kunai, Idaho, have basically uh, put in an IVF lab and, and harvest oocytes as as uh, selected cows move through there. Um, and so uh, once that got started, it, it kind of it it we thought we'd probably be a little farther along with this than we are today, but uh, COVID kind of you know prevented obviously the travel, which we're all familiar with, has sort of slowed that down, but. Uh, it's really in its infancy stages for us and um, um, as we're moving forward. And obviously having a, as, as Dr. Frickley said before, a full blood uh, type of beef animal versus a, a half breed um, has its advantages in, in, in going through the grid system or going through the system um, in terms of an earlier finish, uh, you know, a higher carcass value and, uh, it's kind of what the what the program's all about. I think the cows are, are are pretty much chosen based on an identity and terminal index that they'll use, and so uh, the cows are pretty much the the female side or the donor side is fairly much Angus based. Uh, they'll tell you that, and there could be some semi or other things in there, but but a black hided animal. And, and all the bulls basically are, are some of our high-end Angus bulls that are selected. Uh, there's about 20 different uh, bulls available with, uh, with IVF embryos. So can you tell us um, roughly what conception rates are utilizing these beef embryos? And then maybe uh, after talking about conception rates, going into cost? Yeah, I think the conception rates that uh, we haven't, we don't have a whole lot of data collected and, and I'll let Dr. Fricky comment this as well. But I'll conservatively say probably about 2.4 embryos uh, pregnancy is, is my uh, estimation on it. Uh, I don't know if Paul agrees with that or, or doesn't, but that's, I think it's probably much, it's pretty much in the line of the national, of what's the trend on IVF embryos. Of course, these are frozen. Yeah, and I agree. I agree completely with that. I think you know you get really good first pregnancy outcomes. That comes out to about a forty-two percent conception rate. And there's going to be a drop if you're transferring fresh embryos versus frozen embryos versus you know different types of embryos and things. So that's that would be pretty typical, I would think, and not far from what I showed in the study that Angela did. Um, the cost of these embryos is fifty-five dollars. Um, uh, they are not well. There is a small amount available that are sexed male, um, and those embryos will probably run about a hundred dollars. There's extra cost in, in 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 sorting them that way. So uh, the embryo cost is fifty-five. And is there a, is there a big market for the for the uh, sex embryos? Do you think, Jim, or are people not, a, not caring? They just started making a few available, so I, I don't. Uh, we'll see if the extra cost justifies that. I think of the eight. <clears throat> currently, San Vitra has about eighteen thousand embryos available, or by about eighteen to twenty different sires, and I think there's less than a hundred are that are sexed and. Um, that may have been done for a special situation, but they are they are available. Um, again, I wanna mention if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we can get them answered. Um, one of our next questions, so who would implant these embryos or who is implanting them on the farms that, that are utilizing? Well, over in Minnesota, they have trained uh, a number of technicians. I think they've got at least three to five that are successful at it. We've got a number of technicians that have put an embryo in here and there. We had a few trained by Transova a couple years ago, 
but uh, that's a long process. Uh, right now, I guess if uh, if you know some of the ones that we've sold so far, there's a, a veterinarian or two putting them in. One dairy in central Wisconsin that does a lot of IVF work have done their own, um, but uh, uh, because of COVID, we haven't sent anyone out to Idaho for training at this point, and and. Part of that's going to be based on interest of, of producers, if, you know, if that grows. It's quite expensive to do that, obviously, but the training, it's not like training somebody to breed a cow. There's so much more that has to go into that. Uh, you've got the palpation and, and et cetera. So, so that's been uh, probably be a little bit of the area that we've kind of had to lag in <clears throat> more than we wanted. All right, and I think you um, touched on a little earlier availability of the embryos for producers to to get if they want to try this at their farm. Yes, as I, I think there's about eighteen thousand of them currently and uh, uh, available uh, uh, today from uh, some vitro. We don't carry an inventory in Wakan or or Lansing, but we'll get those shipped out once the you know, there's there's enough different different sires to choose from um, in these embryos, and and most of these bulls that are used are first of all are calving ease, and using in their Angus bulls, but using the dollar B value that the Angus Association has, which includes marbling, uh, gain, both yearling and uh, yearling weight and uh, weaning weights, uh, ribeye area. Uh, since these are going to be animals that are, are basically terminal, uh, try and, you know, use those major kind of traits to produce a pretty quality end product uh, uh, when these animals, whether it's a female or a male or a steer that's, that's sent on to harvest. Um, another question that just came in the chat box, and I'm kind of monitoring some of the questions we have along with the chat. And um, this may be for both um, Jim or Dr. Fricky to answer this. So what is the fee to have an embryo put in by a technician? And then will we really see a conception rate of 2.4 if they're going to be going into animals that are, you know, multi parous cows? And then what would be an expected rate of return? or added value for full-blooded instead of cross? So lots of questions here. I'll Did start I, with the- Oh, go ahead, Jim. I'll just start with the fees. I think the fees are probably somewhere in the 25 to $50 range. It depends on the numbers involved. If it's a single, if it's a multiple, multiple uh, transfers that occur and, um, and so forth. So, uh, return on investment, you know, if if conception rates are high enough, uh, probably on a wet calf basis, which you probably aren't going to sell these on a wet calf basis. They've got way too much value to that. Is is you know probably could be uh, somewhere in the vicinity of a, you know a, you know conservatively say it maybe in the 150 to 180 dollar range. Uh, because you will have an animal that's probably going to finish by the time you get it through the system, maybe 45 days to 60 days quicker uh, than you would uh, at a crossbred calf or a, a full blood Holstein. Yeah, I'll I'll try to take a shot at the um, the embryos con per conception again. 2.4 embryos per conception is about a 42 percent pregnancies per embryo transfer. Um, one thing you have to remember is that fertility, the fertility differences we see, for example, between non-lactating heifers, first lactation cows, and older cows, has to do with the physiology of the animal themselves. And the, and probably, so for example, the reason we see 60% conception rates in non-lactating heifers and down in the 40-some percent for lactating dairy cows is we think there's an impairment in fertility of the oocyte in the, in the lactating cows, okay? When you transfer embryos, all that goes away. 
So now you defer, all you need is a uterus that's synchronized at the right stage of the cycle. And then what happens is fertility kind of defers to the embryo itself, whether it's, uh, whether it's fresh, whether it's frozen, and whether the quality grade and all those kinds of things. So I would expect, yeah, 40%, 42% pregnancies per ET would be a number that I would think would be reasonable. And one of the reasons I say that is not only from published studies, I, I had the, uh, the um, opportunity to travel to Japan a number of years ago. And there was a, um, a guy there that owned an operation where he was raising Wagyu beef animals. He had six or 8,000 Wagyu beef animals, which are very valuable animals in Japan. He had a 1,500 cow dairy. And the only reason he had the dairy cows was as embryo transfer recipients. And so he was doing his own IVF embryo transfer, these Wagyu beef embryos and putting them into Holsteins. There was no AI done in the Holsteins whatsoever. It was all, all embryo transfer. They were setting up all their uh, lactating dairy cows with a synchronized breeding program and then putting embryos in. And their uh, pregnancies per ET on, in those animals was just right at 40 some percent across, across the board. And you don't see dips with heat stress when you do embryos. That's another reason, Jim, I think maybe we want to talk about. Embryos are not susceptible to heat stress like breeding to artificial insemination because the insult to that early embryo happens before day seven in heat stressed animals. So in Florida, for example, they've done experiments when if you, you might get uh, conception rates of 10% to breeding to artificial insemination in heat stressed animals in Florida you can double that or more by putting embryos in. So it's another reason for uh, embryo transfers, perhaps some of the heat stress issues that we have. Yeah, that is actually a good point, Dr. Fricky. That's one of the, the advantages that they've talked about using these IVF embryos, you know, up in this part of the country, whether it's June, July, August, you know, maybe into September, to deal with heat stress uh, versus just breeding them. So. Uh, yes, that, that's that's one of the advantages in, in maybe considering embryos in, in that period. Uh, the other part of that, the other part of that question, Ashley, was what is the expected return on investment or added value for a full blood yep. offspring yep. versus a, a cross? And I don't I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Dr. Larry Cora, who's, who's originally from, I think, Kansas State, has done a little bit of, um, he's retired, but kind of works as an advisor to our beef team. And I think he, he did a quick math that probably in the end product at the harvest, probably $215. Uh, and, and that goes through various stages from the calf ranch, uh, you know, maybe to the backgrounder to the feedlot uh, on the end of that. You know, and, and you have opportunities, or producers would have opportunities to own these animals throughout based on, on where they go. Um, and, and so it's, it's really having a good marketing plan of, of what you're gonna do with these calves. Like I said, I don't think that's designed for the wet calf market. Uh, it certainly can get to the weaning, to the, you know, up to the six to 400 pound stage or whatever then moving them on, but, uh, or you can keep possession of them uh, throughout. Uh, or in some cases, if, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, feed that are a lot, some places considering, you know, uh, selling beef out on the, you know, directly. So uh, that's kind of some of the opportunities that go with this. Um, it's, uh, I think uh, Minnesota had sent their first group of feeders that were in the 700 pound range that were, I believe, uh, I can't remember the birth dates on them exactly, but on into a feedlot in Kansas. And, and, and so uh, you are dealing again with a higher quality product at the end of the day that will finish quicker um, with, the, with the right carcass values, or certainly an ex advantages in those carcass values at the end. So do you think, do you think, Jim, that the big difference between the two is probably just in, in, with regard to efficiency as far as finishing sooner, maybe made more efficient uh, feed conversion ratio, 
those, those sorts of things is probably where the majority of that, I haven't, I know who Larry Corey is, but I haven't seen that particular talk, but I'm imagining that's probably where the, where the big capture is, is right yes, in that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and you don't hear so much about the plants here in Green Bay, but, but like on the Holstein, the liver issues on feeding Holstein steers, the high energy rations that go into them versus the full blood cattle. Uh, there's not much known yet on these crossbreds, but uh, uh, but yes, the efficiency is 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 that quicker feed out, and that's like yeah. anything in raising heifers today or, or or dairy cows. Efficiency is is the bottom line, especially as feed prices dip and beat a pinch. Yeah, that's an interesting comment that you made there, Jim. I have seen Larry Cora's talk on beef on dairy and. And that's an interesting thing in the slaughter plants. The, the issue sometimes is with this liver abscess problem. I guess the incidence of liver abscesses is much higher, particularly when these animals are raised on, like you say, a higher concentrate diet. And it's not that the liver is ex worth much, but what happens is in a plant that's working towards efficiency, they have to shut everything down. They shut the, shut the whole thing down so that they can expect the liver and condemn it and all that kind of right. stuff. So it just slows down the efficiency. And I, I didn't realize that that was one of the bigger issues that they had been running into with these kind of more dairy backgrounded animals in the in the plants. So another Oh, that's a good question. Are all the embryos grade one? Yeah, yes, they are. Everything coming out of some vitro is a grade one embryo. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, my former grad student is on and he's from Brazil. I think my understanding is in Brazil, they're kind of restricting those transfers to grade grade one embryos just because of that that impact of grade that I showed that, that we noticed. And another question that came in, um, could you please repeat how much parentage detail is provided per embryo? Well, the embryo on the male side will be out of one of our, our Angus sires, our top Angus sires again, that's a high dollar beef bull with calving ease, uh, with carcass values, uh, but but that that's the areas of children. The cows uh, are most more than likely belong to Simplot. Again, like I said earlier, they've got a rather extensive cow calf operation, but they do uh, uh, look at the Igenity terminal index. Um, so there's you know. She may not be a purebred Angus necessarily, but she's probably, she is a black hided cow uh, and, and a cow that has a high terminal index. So there's some selection made there. I hope that was the answer to that question. Um, one more question. And again, if you have questions, keep putting them in the chat. We do have, another uh, couple minutes, but um, does Central Star assist in marketing any of these calves at this time? No, we haven't. Uh, we have uh, in the beef on dairy program now, we, 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 uh, we do, we have established relationships with um, two groups, uh, TD Beef, uh, which is a Tulls de Grote operation in terms of, of, of Bulls that uh, they have selected to fit that program through the grid, uh, and, and those are of course the wet calf pickups. And then the other one is is Power Genetics. That's uh, they're more of a Semental uh, based program that that operates the uh, picks up a lot of calves in in Michigan, Indiana. Now I say that with I think select we've been doing some talking whether these embryo calves could be, or somewhere in the system could be a part of that. But, but uh, Minnesota has worked with the, with the calf buyer uh, in the western part of the state, but, uh, but we haven't gotten that far with it yet. And, and maybe our relationship with either TDB for power genetics may be a possibility. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll do another question and then we'll, I think we'll get ready to wrap up, but Will all the embryos be pulled? Um, well, being out of Angus sired, they should be, yes. 
Thank you. Um, any other questions coming in? Uh, Jim, is there anything else that you would like to add at all? Well, we have you on here today. We appreciate your time along with, with um, Dr. Fricky. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can certainly uh, get to me through email. Uh, the availability of the, uh, of the group of embryos that are available. If certain bowls interest you, you do have some selection there. Uh, it's just jim.saporsky at mycentralstar.com. But you're more than welcome to, if you have questions, to, to reach out to me and be more than happy to answer. All right, and I do have your email up here on the screen for, for those interested in, in wanting that. And um, we thank you today for your time. And with that, um, Maria Jose, back to you. Thank you. So we will greatly appreciate your feedback on this program as it helps us develop additional programs in the future. So please take a few moments to answer a few short evaluation questions on the value of this program. A link to the question has been shared in the chat box and you will also receive a link to the evaluation questions in a follow-up email. And here you are seeing some additional programs that, that we will be offering. So on February 2nd, animal care on the farm and beyond. And uh, February 9th, preventing injuries when working with cattle. On February 16th, getting the most out of your farm's data. And February 23rd, getting the most out of your forages. Um, so for a list of uh, all upcoming webinars and registration, please check at the Extension Farm Ready Research webpage. And on behalf of today's speakers and the rest of our Extension team, we thank you for attending and be safe.